I was born in England, but my grandparents came here from Lithuania as Jewish refugees. And for Jews, spread as they are across the world, their religion has always seemed an essential part of their cultural identity. Well, this is the first time in almost 60 years that I've visited a place of worship for anything other than sightseeing. And when I first came here, it was in the name of religion, though not with any religious motive on my part. The fact is, I was sent here by a Jewish father, sent here because he thought that I owed it to what he called my people. And the reason is that quite suddenly, because he had been so appalled about what had happened in the Holocaust and guilty about having escaped it, that he felt that he and I owed some sort of identification with the group. Throughout the war from 1940, at which time I was six, until 1945 or 46, I don't really think that I knew or really understood that I was Jewish. When my father said that I was, I didn't really know what he meant. I came here to several services when I was about 11 or 12 on what were called the High Holidays. But I came here without knowing what I was participating in. It was conducted in a foreign language which I didn't understand, written in a text I couldn't even read. There was singing, but the singing was completely different to the singing with which I had grown much more familiar by virtue of the fact that I was a prep school boy and attended Christian prayers. So I found myself sitting as right at the very back here, as far as I could from the main action, amongst a group of people with whom I felt no particular identity, in spite of what my father told me about my identity. And I stuck it out here during the services as long as I could, wondering just how long I'd have to stay before I could return and satisfy my father that I had in fact attended. Well, my atheism, if that's what one insists on calling it, was not at any point a rejection of anything. What I was being introduced to scarcely seemed to be something against which I had to rebel. This all happened at a time when I simply felt myself to be an English schoolboy. The only thing that I was rebelling against was, well, it certainly wasn't the dogma or the doctrine, because that was completely inaccessible to me, and I hadn't been introduced to it earlier. It was simply that coming here on those occasions took up time when I might otherwise be enjoying myself playing cricket. Is there really no God? And if there really is no supernatural dimension to the universe, why have so many people throughout history and in so many different cultures thought there was? The problem, as I've already said, is that there are so many different forms of skepticism, disbelief and free thought, that it's quite hard to do a straightforward history of it, as if it were something that simply grew to become the fully formed thing we know today. In any case, what it is to be an atheist is itself very complex and very questionable. The word is like atypical or asymmetrical. The word Atheist simply means not really theist. And that, of course, begs the question, well, what is a theist? Oddly enough, it's quite difficult to find a simple, straightforward history of atheism on the religious shelves of your local bookshop. And although the subject is dealt with at considerable length in some of the more scholarly works, it soon becomes apparent that in contrast to each of the three monotheistic religions whose articles of faith are explicitly affirmed from the outset and continue to be expressed throughout their subsequent development, it's quite difficult to identify a correspondingly explicit current 
of denial. In the case of Christianity, for example, for more than a thousand years after its establishment, you'd be hard put to recognize an openly skeptical rebuttal of its supernatural claims. And that's hardly surprising when you consider the cruel penalties which were often inflicted upon anyone convicted of subversive disbelief. Paradoxically, some of the sources of disbelief are to be found amongst the arguments of believers. It's important to understand that Christianity was constantly redesigning its own dogma, and theologians often formulated the most dangerously skeptical arguments in their effort to test the impregnability of their own faith. And in doing so, they unknowingly furnished atheists with ready-made weapons. Now, what we're talking about here is disbelief. And that's a notion which presupposes something which it contradicts. In other words, belief. Because, well, in the absence of belief, the whole idea of disbelief would be unintelligible. So if we're going to trace a history of the various things that we call atheism, we have to understand what we mean when we use the word belief. So I'd like to jump in to what you might regard as the shallow end and consider simply some of the ways in which we talk about belief. To find out more about that, I talked to the English philosopher Colin McGinn at his home in New York. Before I start asking you about your beliefs and disbeliefs, I'd like to get into a, a little bit of uh, an analysis of what we are saying when we talk about believing at all. Um, there seem to be some situations in which one says, I believe this, that, I believe in this, in ordinary yeah. things. Well, the usual idea is they're implicit beliefs or tacit beliefs. Belief is a technical term in, as it's used in philosophy and psychology. I mean, it really just means what you're going to take for granted, what you'll act on, what you'll assent to, what you might gamble on. That means you're committed to its being the case. Belief is, is just an umbrella term to capture all the varieties of assent, of takings to be true. And so that comes, that's a huge variety of different things, actually, all the way from, you know, I, I believe there's a table in front of me to I believe there's no God, or I believe in, you know, uh, a supreme moral principle, or I believe in democracy. I mean, they're all valid uses of the word belief, but different phenomena from case to case. Well, now, in the case of believing, uh, it isn't... Well, when someone has a belief or believes, yeah. um, they don't have to be in that state of mind consciously all the time right. in order to be the upholder of a belief. Yeah, exactly. Now, you can say if somebody fast asleep, he believes that Paris is in France, and it's true, because beliefs are dispositional. Uh, implicit is another term for it. They're unlike thoughts. A thought is a, an occurrent phenomenon when you, at a, a given moment, take, think of something, then you sort of occurrently believe it. The fact is that it sounds rather odd, doesn't it, to say that someone is believing at a particular moment. One can't be in a state of belief all the time. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that we stop believing if we happen to have something else on our mind. It's just that belief is not, in any sense, an episode. It's impossible to say at any given moment that one is entertaining a belief. Now, that doesn't mean that the notion of time is actually inapplicable to belief. After all, someone can become a believer, having not been one sometime earlier, as in the case of St Paul, for example, who was dramatically converted to belief in the divinity of Christ at a particular moment. But once acquired, dramatically or otherwise, belief is not a continuously experienced mental state. In fact, it's somewhat questionable whether belief is actually a state of mind at all. It's certainly not one for which there is a corresponding state of brain that one might be able to identify using a CAT scan, allowing one to say, oh yes, he's having a belief at this moment. Someone who believes in God, for example, 
isn't necessarily entertaining that thought, whatever it is, all the time. If he's trying to remember where he's left his keys, for example, the thought of God's existence or whatever isn't in or on his mind at the time. And when he suddenly finds his key, the state of mind of believing in God doesn't suddenly reassert itself after having been pushed off center stage. It doesn't resume its rightful state after what was a, a moment earlier, a lapse of belief. It's not like that at all. Now, what I've said about belief is also true of knowledge. I know the alphabet. I know my multiplication tables. In fact, I know a large number of things without being explicitly conscious of any of them at any particular moment. But although belief resembles knowledge, there's a very important difference between the two. In the case of belief, you can say that someone believes X and that he was wrong. But it sounds rather odd to say that someone knows X and is wrong. It's part of the definition of knowing something that it is the case. Whereas believing something to be the case is a state of mind about which you could be proved to be wrong. Well, my beliefs, religious or otherwise, represent dispositions rather than a particular state of mind which I might or might not experience at a particular moment. In other words, instead of being an episode in my mental life, my belief is expressed by certain tendencies, a tendency to entertain certain thoughts or feelings. And in the case of religious beliefs, it also involves the disposition to participate in certain social actions which we call rituals, prayers, services and so on, all of which dramatize in some way or another certain attitudes which I assume with regard to the meaning of life and the possibility of its continued existence after my death. In one way or another, these rituals imply the existence of things or entities which I cannot know, in whose existence I must simply believe. Largely, we tend to invoke the notion of belief when there is some sort of disagreement yeah. in the world around you right. about whether one does assent exactly. to this, that or the other. Exactly. That's when we bring, in, bring the notion up, when we're having a discussion about what do you believe, what are your beliefs, means which questionable, debatable issues do you have a, take a particular stand on? And that's when we use the word belief. So that it's about debatable issues that, I think that, it is that belief issues. tends to... Yeah, exactly, that's how we use it. So that's why primarily it's used in connection with, I would say, religion and politics. Because those are issues where people hotly debate the fundamentals of it. And so they, they tend to say, well, this is my belief about the political situation. I believe we should not go to war with Iraq, you know. I believe there's only one God. Now, I'm sure that Colin McGinn would agree with me that it's important to recognize the different implications which the notion of belief has in the case of religion on the one hand and politics on the other. You see, when it comes to politics, and for that matter, ethics, belief refers to how things ought to be. I believe in equal rights. I believe in democracy. And when I say any of these, I'm referring to moral preferences. Whereas in the case of religion, although there are, of course, beliefs which refer to how things ought to be, the main body of religious belief consists of assertions as to the existence of this, that, or the other. Well, even at this point, you can begin to see that belief is rather a complicated idea. And what makes it even more complicated is the extent to which it can be brought about voluntarily, if at all.